Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Mohammed Nur Hussein, and I'm a board member with Brooklyn for Peace. The title of tonight's program is The Coming War with China. What are the causes? What will it entail? How can it be prevented? Our speaker, Michael Clare, will discuss the sources of US China tensions the dangers of the current approach the U.S. government is taking, and how grassroots peace groups can address this issue. Michael Clare is Professor Emeritus of Peace and World Security Studies at Hampshire College, a senior visiting fellow at the Arms Control Association in Washington, D.C. He is the author of 15 books, including most recently, All Hell Breaking Loose the Pentagon's perspective on climate change. He's also the defense correspondent of The Nation magazine and a contributing editor of current history. His articles on US military policy, global resource competition, and arms proliferation have appeared in Foreign Affairs, Newsweek, Scientific American, Technology Review, The Los Angeles Times, and other journals. He is the founder of Committee for a Sane U.S.-China Policy. Michael. Well, thank you for that introduction and hello everybody this evening. And thank you Brooklyn for Peace for giving me this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, this is a very important topic and I'm glad so many people have come out this evening uh, through the, through the, use of Zoom to participate in this conversation. Having said that, I, I wanna be very straight with you tonight and say exactly what I think about this topic. Later, you'll have a chance to question my assessment, but let me say what I think about this topic. And what I see is this, both US and Chinese leaders are behaving in ways that are making a war between our countries ever more likely, and a kind of war that will be utterly catastrophic for both our countries. I don't think a war is inevitable, not yet, but it is becoming more so by the day. And because leaders of both sides think that a war is increasingly likely, they're making preparations for that war and the preparations they're making are making war increasingly inevitable. Both sides view war with each other, their greatest danger and their greatest, pri and, and so preparation for war with each other is their highest priority. And they're pouring many hundreds of billions of dollars into the procurement of weapons and the deployment of weapons for a war with one another and positioning their forces in the Pacific in a way that, as I will explain, increases the risk of a military clash that could escalate into war. And even if war doesn't erupt anytime soon, preparations for that war will poison domestic policy in this country for years to come, resulting in increasing anti-Asian hate violence and discrimination, as well as diminished funds for the domestic programs we all care about, for education, for health, and for climate change action. You're gonna be hearing a lot about this in the months ahead as the new budget comes out next week on March 9th. And as members of Congress vie with one another to boost the defense budget to ever greater heights, um, at the cost of domestic spending. Now, let me unpack this a little bit. Why do I think we're on a collision course towards war? The underlying reason, in my view, is that we have a clash of irreconcilable worldviews on the part of US and Chinese leaders, the people who actually make the decisions on war and peace. We're not included. The people uh, who are listening in tonight are not part of those decision-making elites. 
but the elites are choosing to behave in ways that do make wars more likely. Chinese leaders led by President Xi Jinping seek to restore China's historic status as the dominant power in Asia and to secure a seat as an equal to the United States at the global rules making tables. Now, we amongst us can discuss whether or not that's a legitimate aspiration for the world's number two economy and the world's largest country by population. But our views really don't matter because US elites, and when I talk about US foreign policy elites, I mean the leaders in the White House, in the CIA, in the Pentagon, and the top leadership in Congress, and the pundits, leading pundits in the think tanks in Washington, and the defense lobbyists. They together constitute a, a, a foreign policy elite, some people call it the blob, that makes decisions on US foreign policy. And this elite, this blob, this cabal, unanimously believes that China must never be allowed to become the dominant power in Asia, that the, but rather that the United States remain the dominant power in the Asia Pacific region, and that China should never be allowed to have a seat as an equal to the United States at the world's rules making tables. Indeed, they are united in their commitment to use whatever means necessary, economic, diplomatic, technological, or military to keep China in a second place status relative to the United States. This is now the dominant theme in US foreign and military policy and is likely to remain so for the years to come. For Chinese leaders, of course, this is intolerable and unacceptable. They in turn are prepared to use any means necessary to ensure that China assumes its rightful place on the world stage by any means necessary. So to me, this is the underlying uh, reason why I think war is becoming increasingly likely. But we have to consider two other complicating factors. First, domestic politics in the United States, and second, geographical and military considerations. First, on domestic politics. In the United States, we are seeing a contest between ambitious politicians of both parties to show who can be toughest and cutting trade with China, technological links with China, and to procure weapons to fight China, and most importantly, to convert Taiwan into a US military bastion to fight China. So they're vying with one another to who could lead in all of these uh, efforts. All of the potential Republican candidates for president and other ambitious figures like House Speaker Kevin McCarthy of California have signaled that they will make toughness on China and aid for Taiwan a litmus test for party support and that they will be campaigning on this issue. And so we're going to be hearing them, uh, you know, trying to out, out, uh, tough, out tough each other in who could be strongest in their opposition to China and support for Taiwan. This means we will see legislation coming forward in the coming months that will make any scientific or technological contact with China essentially illegal in this country and put at risk thousands or more Chinese Americans and others who are currently work at American universities and laboratories who might come under attack. And we're also going to see the erasure of 40 years of diplomacy between the US and China by turning, by converting Taiwan into a military ally of the United States in violation of all the pledges made 
to, to China by U.S. leaders since 1979 to respect Taiwan as part of one China, part, part of the mainland, uh, part of a, a one China, including Taiwan and the mainland. For Chinese officials, this is the point of no return. They've said over and over again that abrogation of the one China policy and conversion of Taiwan into a US military ally is a red line that cannot be crossed and will result in a conflagration. Will they carry through on this threat? Uh, this is where Chinese domestic politics enter the equation. President Xi is facing public discontent over his handling of the COVID crisis and over dis, dis, disappointing economic growth in the past few years. The loss of Taiwan to the US uh, as uh, advocated by Congress would be an enormous blow to his prestige as US elites are well aware and he may well feel obliged to invade Taiwan despite the risks involved. If she doesn't invade, his power and that of the Chinese Communist Party will truly be weakened. And this no doubt is the desire of US elites. So he is facing a very difficult choice in the months ahead. And, so, and you can appreciate how explosive this situation has become. So US elites see every reason to step up the pressure on China, even at the risk of provoking a conflict. And the pressure will be increased uh, by the day in the months ahead. Now we come to the other complicating factor, and that is geography. Uh, the fact is that the US and China have overlapping spheres of defensive influence or however you want to put it. Uh, the US claims, US leadership claims that America's forward defense line extends to the coast of China and includes the islands and the waters of the South China Sea and the East China Sea and Taiwan. And those include islands that are claimed by China, the Spratly Islands and the Diayu or Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, and of course, Taiwan. Uh, China, for its part, claims these waters as part of its national territory. And indeed, uh, be believes that the islands are part of its sovereign territory, including Taiwan. Uh, this has led to a situation of constant military risk. China has militarized some of the islands in the South China Sea, the Spratly Islands, and the US considers this illegitimate and to demonstrate its position has repeatedly sends US warships into the, it, it, this, the very close vicinity of those islands on what are called PHONOPs, Freedom of Navigation Operations. These happen monthly. China often sends its own ships to chase away American ships coming very close, often close enough to ram American ships. So that is one place where a conflict could arise overnight. In the East China Sea, uh, China sends its vessels, uh, Coast Guard vessels around the Senkaku Islands, as does Japan. The United States just recently, last month, announced that it would extend its offense of Japan to include the Senkaku Islands. So if Japan, Japanese ships are attacked at the in the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, that could be a cause for US military intervention. And then there's Taiwan, as I've said, could be the cause of a conflict at any time. China, to show its disapproval 
of the way Taiwan is headed, daily sends up planes and ships into the waters around Taiwan. In response, Taiwan sends up its planes to intercept Chinese planes, and they come within eyeball range of each other. The US, to show its support for Taiwan, sends its Navy vessels into the Taiwan Straits monthly on these phone ops operations. Uh, just another, just the other day, uh, one of these operations occurred. That could lead to a clash at any moment. And let me be clear, if a conflict broke out between the US and China in the Western Pacific, we're talking about a conflict that would be extraordinarily catastrophic. It's likely that China would attempt to avert losses by, by trying to sink US aircraft carriers and warships and to destroy US bases in the area. It has deployed hundreds of ballistic missiles for that purpose. On the other hand, the US has deployed ships, planes, and missiles to attack Chinese assets on the mainland of China, around Chinese port cities, air bases, radar stations, and the like. So we'd be talking in the first hours of a battle of possible losses of thousands, tens of thousands of American and Chinese sailors and, and soldiers and air, air pilots and the like. Within hours, there would be catastrophic losses. Taiwan would probably be leveled as we see in Ukraine. And because many US bases are in Japan, Japan would come under attack and the war would spread. So we're talking about a war that could reach a, a pre-nuclear level within hours. Would it go nuclear? Nobody could say it would or it wouldn't. And both sides are armed and prepared to fight a nuclear war. So we're talking about an exceedingly dangerous scenario that could arise at any moment. This is what I feel to be true. And I see no effort uh, on the part of American leaders to, or Chinese leaders to slow this process down and reverse course. So how do we prevent this catastrophe from occurring? Uh, I want to finish my remarks by talking about that, that prospect. I think we have to start with the fact that it's on us. Uh, we have no allies in Congress. This is an extraordinary and distressing fact. There's not one single member of Congress, not AOC, not Representative Ilhan Omar, not Bernie Sanders, not Barbara Lee, who is resisting the rush to war with China at this moment. Not one of them. They're all falling in line behind the party line of the American leadership elite that war with China uh, is a very real possibility and we have to arm ourselves to the teeth uh, to uh, be pr prepared for such a conflict. So we're on our own. Now we've been here before during the Cold War nuclear arms race and during the Vietnam War period. And we know that it sometimes falls on us, the grassroots to prevent catastrophe, to take responsibility for national safety and salvation. And that's the case now. It's our responsibility to avert catastrophe. What does that mean? Well, it means that preventing a war with China has to become our overriding priority. Now, I know that we have other important priorities, ending the war in Ukraine and restoring nuclear arms control talks between the US and Russia are the most important among them. And we're all committed to that. 
but nothing threatens our survival and well-being and that of our families and our children and grandchildren more than a war with China. A war with China, even if it didn't go nuclear, would result in higher US casualties than we've seen in any war since World War II. It would destroy the economies of both countries and the major countries in Asia. And it would poison world politics uh, for decades to come. And it would make action on climate change impossible. So this has to be our priority. If you disagree, we could talk about that uh, later. But if you uh, want to know how serious this is, I advise, I suggest you spend a week in Washington walking the halls of Congress and at pleading with them to reduce the defense budget. And you'll hear what I'm talking about, about the urgency of spending more tens, hundreds of billions of dollars mm. for weapons to fight China. So once we make that commitment, what do we do? <laughs> And the answer, I think, has to be a combination of public education, media outreach, and political engagement. And we know how to do that. You know how to do that. We need more events like this every day, everywhere in the country, either in public or by Zoom. And there are groups that, uh, like New York Peace Action, and the group I work with, the Committee for Sane US-China Policy that can help with speakers, finding speakers for such events. But the public needs to know about the dangers that we face if we're on our current track. We need to write letters to the editor and op-eds to the media wherever we can. Uh, contesting the notion that preparation <laughs> for a war with China has to be uh, the, our number one priority, and that a conflict with China uh, is, a, uh, is the right way to address the Taiwan situation. And instead argue in favor of diplomacy as the solution to our disagreements with China. Now, let me say, this does not mean defending China's behavior by no means. There's much to criticize about China's handling of its uh, ethnic minorities like the Uyghur Turks of Xinjiang province or its approach uh, to uh, civil liberties in Hong Kong or its approach to, mar to the maritime claims, its maritime claims in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. But these disputes should be addressed through diplomacy, not through military provo provo provocative military maneuvers. And uh, if you want to, if you could want some ideas for how to address these vexing issues, please visit our website saneuschinapolicy.org. To conclude then, war with China is not inevitable, but it won't be prevented by some angels in Congress or in the Chinese leadership in Beijing. It's not going to happen by itself. It will require action from all of us, from the grassroots, and we have to make that a priority. We'd like to say that uh, one of the things we're pleased about is bringing this subject up. So many of us in the peace movement have been so busy concentrating on, the, on Ukraine, which is very understandable, that we've often let the issue of China slip into the background. Uh, so we really appreciate hearing this. Thank you so much, Michael, for your very important talk. It sounds like I just a few of the takeaways are, it's on us. The grassroots must take responsibility with media outreach, political activism, more events to educate the public, write letters to editors, op-eds, arguing in favor of diplomacy on this issue. And that for more ideas, and maybe somebody will put this in the chat, 
visit um, the website saneuschinapolicy.org and include the argument when you're doing your activism. I believe Michael has suggested include the argument that we need cooperation on climate change and that we must start nuclear stability talks with China. This is vital.